September 1941, 10 weeks after the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Now Moscow itself was braced for the German onslaught. Barricades and anti-tank obstacles blocked the streets. Windows were taped up to reduce the danger from flying glass caused by explosions. And at night, the city was immersed in total darkness. Lit windows helped the enemy, warned the posters. Stalingrad, for the moment, was safe in the Russian heartland. Bandaged soldiers on the city streets were the only visible sign of battles that raged many miles to the west. In the workshops of the Stalingrad tractor factory, tank production was round the clock. The enormous losses suffered by the Red Army that summer had to be made good. That summer, hundreds of tanks had been abandoned because their crews couldn't fix simple mechanical failures. Now, tank crews began their training inside the factories. They were taught every mechanical detail of their new tank and how to fix them if they broke down. One of the commanders of these newly formed tank brigades was the 40-year-old Colonel Mikhail Katakov. Katakov began the war as the commander of the 20th Tank Division. But its obsolete tanks had proved cannon fodder for the Germans in the summer of 1941. Katakov and the remnants of his division had been lucky to escape encirclement. In late September, his brigade's new T-34 tanks were loaded onto trains. Mikhail Katakov and the 4th Tank Brigade were going to Moscow. Moscow had already had its first taste of war. The first German air raid came exactly one month after the war began, on the 22nd of July, 1941. German pilots were told, you've bombed England, this will be much easier. If the Russians even have anti-aircraft guns, there won't be many of them. They don't have searchlights, balloons, or night fighters. But these illusions were soon shattered. The skies over Moscow were defended by thousands of anti-aircraft guns of all calibers. Soviet night fighters attacked German bombers caught in the searchlights. Barrage balloons rose to 2,500 meters, and in pairs as high as 4,500 meters, much higher than over London. The risk of flying into their steel cables forced German bombers to fly at much higher altitudes from where they were much less accurate. But inevitably, some bombers got through. The Belaruski rail terminal, the telephone exchange, and army supply depots were all hit. The Kremlin itself was hit by six incendiaries and one 250-kilogram high-explosive bomb. It pierced the roof of the Grand Kremlin Palace and the ceiling of the Georgievsky Hall, but it failed to explode. On the night of the 12th of August, a 1,000-kilogram bomb landed in Nitskyevorota Square, making a crater 12 metres deep and 32 metres across. But German bomber crews were made to pay a heavy price for these successes. A total of 134 air raids were made on Moscow. More than 1,500 bombs and 45,000 incendiaries were dropped on the city during the war. The biggest raid was on the 29th of October, 1941. More than 300 bombers took part. Bombs hit the Bolshoi Theater, the Moscow State University, and the Central Committee of the Communist Party. 47 German planes were brought down that day. 
Hitler's invasion plan called for the capture of Moscow in the first three to four months of the war. But fighting around Smolensk and Kiev had held the Germans up for two months. The assault on Moscow was not ready to begin until the 30th of September. The Soviet high command, the Stavka, expected the Germans to attack along the highway from Smolensk to Vyazma. Red Army units under General Rokossovsky began to dig in along this route. But the Germans were planning a surprise. General Herpner's 4th Panzer Group had been secretly redeployed from the Leningrad front to join the attack on Moscow. To conceal this maneuver, the Panzer Group left its headquarters radio operator near Leningrad. Each radio operator working in Morse code has a distinct style of transmitting based on their rhythm, just as each pianist has their own unique style of playing. Experts can pick out individual radio operators just by listening in to their transmissions. When the Soviets intercepted radio messages near Leningrad, which they knew came from the radio operator of 4th Panzer Group, they assumed Herpner's forces were still in the area. But all they were listening to was one lone radio operator. Commander of the 4th Panzer Group, Erich Herpner, was an old-fashioned general, known as the Old Cavalryman. Nevertheless, he'd been one of the first generals to understand and embrace the principles of armoured warfare. Three German panzer groups now targeted Moscow, led by Herpner, Guderian and Hoth, who was replaced in October by General Reinhardt. The German plan was to force a final decisive battle for Moscow in which they would encircle and annihilate the remnants of the Red Army. The operation was codenamed Typhoon. The offensive began near Bryansk. Red Army troops were ready to defend the town itself, which lay at the center of the local road network. But on the 30th of September 1941, Guderian's panzers attacked much further south. Heinz Guderian had a reputation as the father of German Blitzkrieg, based on his early writings on the theory of offensive, mechanized warfare. He was also a bold and energetic field commander who often quarreled with his superior officers. In three days, Guderian's tanks had encircled the bulk of the enemy forces opposing him. In two more days, his troops had reached Oral and were advancing on Tula. In a desperate attempt to halt Guderian's advance, the Soviet high command took a bold decision to reinforce Oral by air. Giant Tupolev TB3s and Lisunov Li2s landed at the deserted airfield. The Germans, recovering from their surprise, opened a withering fire on the second wave. Nevertheless, 6,000 men plus equipment and ammunition was landed. The troops immediately went into action against the advancing Germans. Soon, T-34s from Colonel Katakov's 4th Tank Brigade also began to arrive after their 500-mile train journey from Stalingrad. Tank brigades replaced the Soviet mechanized corps that had been destroyed that summer. A mechanized corps had contained 36,000 men, 1,000 tanks, plus guns and other vehicles. It was a huge and unwieldy formation. The new, more mobile tank brigades had just 3,000 soldiers and 91 tanks. Katakov now had a chance to test the tank ambush tactics that so far he'd only been able to practice on the training ground. First, the tanks had to be concealed, using buildings, bushes, or uneven ground. 
several alternative positions were needed for each tank. Dummy positions were also built to confuse the enemy. A T-34's gun could destroy any German tank from a range of one kilometer. But the key to success was patience and discipline. Katakov told his men, the crew in ambush may open fire only at point-blank range when a hit is guaranteed. This means a range of 200 to 300 meters. When taking on a German panzer column, Soviet gunners would target the lead tank first and then the rear tank. With the road blocked in both directions, the rest of the column became sitting ducks. One member of Katakov's brigade was the Soviet tank ace Dmitry Lavrinenka. In 28 engagements, he destroyed 52 German tanks, believed to be the most by any Soviet tank commander in the whole war. The tank ambushes proved to be highly effective. Oral fell to the Germans, but Katakov's tanks bought time to reinforce Tula. As Red Army paratroopers reinforced the southern flank, the Germans launched their main thrust in the center. German Army Group center rapidly outmaneuvered and defeated the Soviet reserve and western fronts, securing the highway from Smolensk to Vyazma. Operation Typhoon was in full swing. The fate of Russia hung in the balance. The Germans had broken through on the road to Moscow. On the 4th of October, 1941, General Konyev told the Soviet high command that his forces were about to be cut off but he received no order to retreat. The Stavka seemed unable to accept that another major disaster was unfolding in front of them. Hitler, meanwhile, was convinced of final victory. He addressed the crowds at the Sportpalast in Berlin. Huge events are now unfolding on the Eastern Front. We have launched a large-scale operation that will lead to the final elimination of the enemy in the East. Once again, the Stavka's order to retreat came too late. More than half a million Red Army soldiers had become encircled around Vyazma and Bryansk. The divisions and regiments that did escape the encirclement began a headlong retreat. With bitter humor, they referred to this maneuver as the Scarpa March. It was becoming all too familiar to the Red Army soldiers who'd survived the summer. Enemy air superiority had a particular impact on Soviet morale. The 43rd Army reported, German bombers attack without mercy. They make raids in groups of 20 to 25 aircraft. Survivors are left senseless. One aircraft was especially feared by the soldiers. The Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber was the airborne artillery of the German Blitzkrieg machine. By attacking targets in a steep dive, it was able to deliver its bombs with pinpoint accuracy. The aircraft would then circle and attack other targets with light bombs and machine guns. These sustained attacks sowed chaos and destruction ahead of advancing ground troops. The bulk of German Army Group Center was needed to encircle the Soviet armies of Generals Konyev and Budyoni. But several divisions, led by SS Panzer Division Das Reich, began moving east. These troops had been given the honor of being the first to enter the Russian capital. The Germans were just 205 kilometers from Moscow, and the road ahead was almost clear. 
The Red Army rushed a battalion of paratroopers to the area. Armed only with machine guns, rifles and Molotov cocktails, they fought ferociously to hold the bridge over the Ugra River. By the end of the day, from 430 men, just 29 were left. By the time a tank brigade arrived to help them, the signpost read 180 kilometers to Moscow. The Germans had advanced just 25 kilometers. Despite such fierce resistance, the Red Army faced a catastrophe. It had suffered huge losses over the course of the summer. The enemy was at the doorstep of their capital. Reinforcements were on their way from the east, but Stalin desperately needed more time. In this, the darkest hour, he sent for General Zhukov. After arriving at general headquarters in Moscow and quickly appraising the situation, Zhukov drew a simple, stark conclusion. The defensive front in the West has been destroyed. A huge gap has appeared in our front line and there is nothing to fill it as there are no reserves. The roads leading to Moscow are open. Hitler's confidence seemed well placed. But there was a small window of time for General Zhukov. Soviet troops encircled near Vyazma were fighting on, meaning for a short time only a few German divisions could be spared for the advance on Moscow. Zhukov's immediate task was to halt this German advance and restore Moscow's defenses before the full weight of German Army Group's center fell upon them. The Majeska defensive line, 120 kilometers from Moscow, was the last obstacle between the Germans and the capital. In early October, everyone not fighting who could lift a shovel was helping to build the Majeska line. Zhukov planned to fill it with troops, but the only spare ones he could find were officer cadets from Moscow's military schools. It was a sign of how desperate the situation had become. The Majeska line was more than 200 kilometers long. It could not all be held by teenage cadets. Seven rifle divisions were being formed near Moscow, but realistically, these raw recruits could only fend off the Germans for a few hours. The Stavka had to take one of the war's many hard decisions. In besieged Leningrad, there were already serious food shortages. The Stavka had gathered reserves to launch a counterattack that would lift the siege and end the city's suffering. But just hours after the disaster at Vyazma, this operation was cancelled. The reserves were ordered to reboard the trains. They were now bound for Moscow and the Majeska line. The elite SS Das Reich Division was spearheading the German advance on Moscow. Its troops were well-trained, experienced and had the best equipment. Near the battlefield of Borodino, where the Russians had fought Napoleon in 1812, they met the Soviet 32nd Division. These were fresh troops hurriedly redeployed from the Far East. Their headquarters had been symbolically sited where General Kutuzov's headquarters had stood in 1812. The first German tanks appeared on the Moscow-Minsk Highway. Near the village of Yelnia, the road descended into a deep hollow as it crossed the river. Soviet pillboxes housing anti-tank guns overlooked the crossing from the opposite bank. When the German tanks reached the bottom, the Soviet guns opened fire. There was no space for the tanks to turn around or get off the road. The German panzers were knocked out one by one. 
The SS troops included fascist volunteers from France. Field Marshal von Kluger addressed them before the battle, reminding them how, under Napoleon, Germans and French had fought side by side against the Russians on this very field. The next day, the French Legion plunged into battle. But in the face of Soviet armored counterattacks, it suffered devastating losses. The unit had to be withdrawn from the front line. Zhukov's orders were clear. Hold fast at the Majeska line. Every day they held out allowed more time for reinforcements to reach Moscow. The German advance was now measured in hundreds of meters, not miles. The Das Reich division suffered massive casualties that included most of its officers. The Germans tried to blast the defenders out of their positions. Ivan Makuka, a cadet from the Podolsk Artillery School, recalled the experience. Direct hits on our pillbox caused blast waves that knocked us off our feet and left us bleeding from our eyes and ears. The reinforced Germans renewed the assault. Kaluga fell on the 13th of October. Borovsk three days later. The 32nd Division was forced to retreat from Borodino. In ferocious fighting, the enemy's advance was halted once more at the Protva and Nara rivers. A staff officer of the German 52nd Panzer Corps reported, the recent fighting to take Russian positions was the fiercest of the entire campaign. Our tank losses have risen dramatically since the start of this operation. For the Germans, the honor of being the first troops into Moscow had turned into a nightmare of blood and smoke. All possible measures were being taken for the defense of Moscow. All the major roads into Moscow were mined, including those leading to Kiev, Old Kiev, Mozhesk, Zvinigorod, Leningrad, and Dimitrov. The bridges were also mined. Obstacles were placed across the rail tracks. In total, more than 150 minefields surrounded the city. Meanwhile, Soviet troops encircled near Vyazma and Bryansk continued to resist, much to the surprise and frustration of the German planners. Twenty-four German divisions earmarked for the attack on Moscow had to be held back to fight the encircled Red Army units. Von Funk, commander of the 7th Panzer Division, reported that combat following the encirclement of the Russians was some of the heaviest the division ever experienced. Some of our Panzer Grenadier platoons were wiped out to a man. It took a full week for the Germans to crush the resistance inside the pocket. Of 580,000 men encircled near Vyazma and Bryansk, 130,000 were killed or missing in action, and 370,000 were taken prisoner. Only 85,000 men broke out of the encirclement. Front Commander Yerimenka was seriously wounded and evacuated by air. Major General Petrov, commander of the 50th Army, and Major General Rakutin, commander of the 24th Army, were amongst the dead. Amongst those captured were Lieutenant General Yershikov, who died in a German prisoner of war camp. Major General Vishnevsky, liberated by the Red Army in 1945. And the wounded commander of the 19th Army, 
Lieutenant General Lukin. Lukin survived the German camps and was liberated in 1945. When Stalin heard the news, he said, tell Lukin my words of gratitude for Moscow. Stalin wrote on Lukin's file, loyal man to be restored in rank. He was not always so generous to those who'd surrendered to the Germans. It was mid-October. As the bulk of Army Group Center completed the destruction of the encircled Soviet armies, the autumn rains began to fall. The roads soon turned to rivers of mud. The German troops complained that it was impossible to conduct offensive operations in these conditions. But muddy roads were a handicap to both sides. Colonel Katakov recalled, even T-34s could foul their tracks and become stranded in the mud. Staff cars had to be towed by tanks or carried on trucks, otherwise they would never get through. Many German officers later blamed their failure to take Moscow entirely on the weather. But in private, many admitted that the German high command had badly underestimated Soviet determination and the scale of their reserves. For now, the German offensive was literally bogged down. In Moscow, news of the German advance threatened to cause panic on the streets. On the 15th of October, the Central Committee of the Communist Party was evacuated, as well as most of the ministries and foreign embassies. The next day, many shops and factories stayed closed. Workers were left on the streets with nothing to do. Rumors began to spread. On the orders of Commissar Lazar Kaganovich, the metro stopped running. It was rigged with explosives so that it could be blown up if the Germans entered the city. Trams stayed in their depots. The roads leading east to safety were blocked with cars. The Luftwaffe stepped up its air raids. The streets were awash with rumors of spies and saboteurs. The situation demanded urgent measures. Alexander Sherbakov, first secretary of the Moscow City Committee, went on the air. He assured citizens that Moscow would not be abandoned. The NKVD secret police would patrol the streets and restore order. Checkpoints were set up everywhere. People trying to leave the city with valuables were closely scrutinized. Looters and scaremongers were sentenced by military tribunals and shot by firing squad. And posters went up across the city announcing a concert by the film star Lyubov Oliver. The posters had their desired effect. If Russia's biggest celebrity was in town, the situation couldn't be that bad. In fact, at the beginning of November, the Moscow front was relatively stable. But there was no room for complacency. The cry was not a step back, and it was rigorously enforced. On the 4th of November, an order was read out to the officers of the 133rd Rifle Division. Its commanders, Gerasimov and Commissar Shabalov, were to be executed by firing squad for disobeying orders to hold the town of Ruza. They had retreated without authorization. Stalin knew his own movements would be crucial. He chose to remain in Moscow and inspect the parade held every year to mark the anniversary of the revolution. All preparations for the parade were made in complete secrecy. Even the units taking part weren't told in advance. And at the last moment, the start time was brought forward by two hours. At 10 past 8 on the morning of the 7th of November, 
Every radio station in the Soviet Union broadcast Stalin's speech from Red Square. It was a supreme act of state theater. No other parades were held in Moscow until the end of the war. To hold one in 1941, the hour of greatest danger, showed the world Stalin and the Soviet Union's determination to fight to the bitter end. The troops seen here parading through Red Square would go straight on to the front line. There they would take part in some of the bloodiest and most decisive fighting of the entire war. Muscovites had been fully mobilized for the defense of their city. They built fortifications and made weapons. The dynamo and Kalinin factories produced mortars. Automobile factories now made submachine guns. By the 5th of November, Muscovites had made donations to the defense fund worth more than 80 million rubles. They had given eight kilos of gold, 377 kilos of silver, and 1.4 kilos of platinum. But now, with the ground frozen hard, German Army Group Center received orders to renew its offensive. Moscow was not just the spiritual heart of Russia. It was also the transport hub for the entire Soviet Union. All the major road and rail networks converged here. If Moscow fell, the Soviet Union would be almost defenseless. By the time Army Group Center renewed its assault, the city's defenses had been considerably strengthened. Reinforcements continued to arrive from the Far East. Katakov's tank brigade was one of the units sent to guard the approaches to Moscow. Like an increasing number of Red Army officers, Katakov could now consider himself a combat veteran. Understanding the role of air reconnaissance in German success, Katakov wrote, tank tracks and footsteps in deep snow can clearly be seen from the air. This isn't taken into consideration by our soldiers, who walk around their positions creating a network of paths that can be seen from above. Katakov recommended changes to standing orders to reduce visibility from the air. The Red Army was slowly learning its craft. Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army resumed its advance through the city of Tula towards Kolomna. 3rd and 4th Panzer groups had been redeployed to the north. Their objectives were the crossings over the Ivankovo Reservoir, with the aim of encircling Moscow from the north. 
The simultaneous assault of two panzer groups caused Soviet defenses to buckle. But the line did not break. The Red Army retreated and dug in again around the town of Klin. Katakov recalled, we retreated with heavy hearts. Every single kilometer yielded to the enemy brought the fighting closer to Moscow. We passed road signs reading 60 kilometers to Moscow, then 55, then 53. South of Moscow, Guderian bypassed Tula, but ran into determined resistance from General Belov's dismounted cavalry units. By the 30th of November, German observers could see the spires of the Kremlin. Motorcyclists from Herpner's 4th Panzer Group reached Kimki, a Moscow suburb less than 15 miles from the Kremlin. According to one account, the intruders were all killed. In another, they were forced to beat a hurried retreat. It would prove to be the high watermark of the German invasion. In his memoirs, Guderian wrote, the offensive on Moscow failed. All the sacrifices and efforts of our valiant troops had been in vain. As a result, the army's strength and morale was greatly undermined. Just as German reserves were stretched to the limit, the Stavka was gathering fresh divisions to unleash a devastating counterattack. One army prepared to hit Reinhardt's panzer group from the flank near Solnezhnogorsk. Another was aimed at the flank of Guderian's panzer army near Stalinogorsk. Another army would roll back the Germans from the immediate vicinity of Moscow. On the 29th of November, Zhukov phoned Stalin to request that he give the order to begin the counteroffensive. Stalin issued the orders that evening. As German soldiers struggled to cope with the plummeting temperatures, as low as minus 30 degrees centigrade by night, they could at least take comfort in the latest intelligence reports. The enemy's combat capabilities in this area, they claimed, are not sufficient to conduct any large-scale counteroffensive. But sunrise on the 5th of December brought a terrible shock. Fresh Soviet tank brigades and infantry divisions launched a full-scale assault along the whole front. They tore across the frozen landscape, forcing the Wehrmacht into retreat and fighting fierce battles against a desperate rear guard. Hundreds of German vehicles, having run out of fuel or antifreeze, lay abandoned at the roadside. Many German soldiers now thought of nothing but survival. General Schall recalled, more and more soldiers abandoned their weapons, but could be seen leading livestock or perhaps dragging a sleigh loaded with sacks of potatoes. Soldiers killed in air attacks were left unburied. In the south, Guderian was also in full retreat. With a heavy heart, he wrote, on the 6th of December, I ordered our troops to cease all attacks and begin a retreat to our original lines. The pursuers had become the pursued. The call, not a step back, became the battle cry, forward. There was to be no mercy for the invader. Meanwhile, Field Marshal von Bock was echoing Soviet orders of just a few weeks before. A commander may only order a withdrawal with the permission of his army commander. A division will not retreat 
without my personal authorization. To add to the suffering, the troops were experiencing the coldest Russian winter in 140 years. A German doctor's diary recorded, a Russian can live in this wilderness. He can make a stove out of a pair of empty jerry cans. Our men only know how to warm themselves by burning precious petrol. The Wehrmacht faced the same fate as Napoleon's army, total ruin. They had been forced back more than 100 kilometers from the gates of Moscow. It was the first large-scale repulse of German forces in World War II. Footage of thousands of German prisoners and their wrecked vehicles was seen around the world. Hitler blamed defeat on a failure of will amongst his top generals. Field Marshal von Brauchitsch was sacked as commander-in-chief of the German army. His successor was Adolf Hitler. Von Bock was replaced as commander of Army Group Center by Field Marshal Gunther von Kluger. Guderian clashed with the high command once more and was relieved of command. For ordering a retreat, Herpner was sacked and stripped of his decorations. In 1944, he was hanged for plotting against Hitler. However, Hitler's demands that the army stand fast and offer fanatical resistance had effect. The front line was eventually stabilized as the Germans dug in and fought the Red Army to a standstill. Meanwhile, the Soviet Supreme Command launched an offensive along the entire front, from besieged Leningrad in the north to the Black Sea in the south. Outside Moscow, the Red Army tried to break through to Vyazma and cut off Army Group Center's main supply route. Stalin hoped for a grand encirclement. The German high command fed in fresh divisions from Western Europe. As they reinforced the front line, the lead elements of the Soviet encirclement themselves became cut off. Two Soviet armies, General Belov's cavalry corps and thousands of paratroopers were trapped around Vyazma. Their attempts to fight their way out ended in failure. As 33rd Army was surrounded and crushed, its commander, General Yefremov, committed suicide rather than be taken prisoner. Maslenikov's 39th Army and the paratroopers dispersed to fight on as guerrillas. Only part of Belov's cavalry corps managed to escape, galloping through the forests to rejoin the Soviet front line. The Red Army still had much to learn. Zhukov told his officers, if you want to keep your commands, I insist that you stop ordering criminal frontal attacks on well-defended enemy positions. You should attack along ravines, through forests, or where there is some cover from enemy fire. By April 1942, the disruption to Soviet industry meant the Red Army was running out of tanks and ammunition. Its losses exacerbated by its own tactical blunders, had been enormous. As the spring thaw began, the Soviet counteroffensive was called off. Germany had entered a war of attrition against the Soviet Union, its spirits raised by the successful defense of the capital. In the battle for Moscow and in the Soviet counteroffensive, the Germans suffered 400,000 casualties. They had lost 1,300 tanks and 2,500 guns. By comparison, in the conquest of Poland, they had suffered just 44,000 casualties 
and in the defeat of France, 154,000. At the Nuremberg trials, Field Marshal Keitel, chief of the German High Command, was asked when he knew that the invasion of the Soviet Union had failed. He replied with one word, Moscow.